Hi everyone, we're gonna get started in a minute. We just wanna give people some time to join, so please sit tight, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to all of our Zoomers from across the country and to those future listeners who may be tuning into our recording. We're really excited to be here with you all today to really just have what we hope is a conversation around integrating the science of reading and core instruction and then chatting about those key elements of science-based reading instruction. So before we get started, we'd like to share some housekeeping information. Um, this webinar is being recorded if you do have technical difficulties, please let us know in the questions panel. Um, we also recommend restarting your Zoom application. And at the end of today's webinar, we'll be answering questions. So send those into the question panel at any time through the Q&A. Now that we've went over our housekeeping information, happy Thursday, everyone. My name is Megan Mobert, and I'm a former elementary teacher from Louisiana. Um, the majority of my time in the classroom was spent with kindergarten through second grade students. Those foundational years that are extremely impactful on students' reading success in later, year, in later years. It's through my experience with teaching reading that led me to learning about the science of reading and gave me the opportunity to work with educators from different parts of the country who, like myself, were putting the science of reading into action through utilizing Amplify's core literacy curriculum. And I'm Karen Venditti from Indiana. I've had a range of teaching experiences from first grade to middle school up to working alongside pre-service educators and cooperating teachers. I shifted gears a few years back and now for the past six years, I've really had the pleasure of working with tons of amazing educators across the country who've been implementing a high quality instructional program created around the science of reading. Karen and I really enjoy working for Amplify now as curriculum specialists because it allows us to continue learning about current reading science and also gives us an opportunity to share our passion for effective literacy instruction with all of you here today. So now that we've introduced ourselves, we want to know more about you. So let's participate in a poll to find out who's joining us. Tell us who you are. We've got lots of choices here and we hope that we hit everyone on the call. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited to see who's here.
and we'll give you another few seconds. All right, it looks like we have a lot of participants here, Karen. Um, Oh, we've even got some parents and pre-service educators. I love it. I love it. You know what? I hope my parents are joining too. <laughs> I definitely invited them. Um, but we have interventionists, classroom teachers, reading specialists. Thank you all for joining us and welcome. So not sure if you guys um, have heard all the buzz about the science of reading, but chances are you have since you actually are joining us. But there's been a groundswell movement that's been sweeping across the country about the science of reading. Over the past few decades, the nation's NAEP reading proficiency data has become quite alarming. News reporters and journalists, along with educators, have really started to dig into the reason behind our lack of progress as a nation towards developing proficient readers. Um, their findings share what cognitive scientists and reading researchers have known for years to be true about how the human brain learns to read. Whether it be Emily Hanford's podcast or Education Week series about the science of reading, the Natalie Wexler's release of the knowledge gap, and Tim Shanahan's weekly literacy blogs, everyone's confirming that now more than ever is the time for educators to embrace this call to action and make the shift to implementing core literacy instruction that is grounded in reading research. If you tuned in on, um, to Susan Lambert's webinar in, at the end of January, um, you got to hear uh, you know, what an effective literacy program is all about. Susan really highlighted what the science of re reading really means, the, elephant, the elements of effective literacy programs, um, the importance of connecting intervention and utilizing data to identify risk and monitor student performance to inform instruction. And so today we're going to dive a little deeper into what the science of reading looks like when put into action during core instruction. So Megan, let's start with a quick review for new attendees and confirm some ideas for everybody. We want to just make sure we're all on the same page because so many times in education we throw out ideas and people have a different picture of what that means. <laughs> yeah, Karen, that's a great idea. I think we should definitely review and clarify any misconceptions from the get-go to ensure that we're all on the same page. So many of you will be familiar with Goff and Tumner's simple view of reading. You know, a number of years ago, these two detailed a really uncomplicated way to understand that complex combination of skills that results in our ability to read. And yes, they simply called it the simple view of reading. In order to become a proficient reader, people must be able to decode the words on a page or really simply just convert that, those written words into speech. And they have to have the ability to understand that speech to make meaning of the words that they're reading. They suggest that both are equally as important in that equation. And you've probably already noticed that it's a multiplication formula. You know, if someone is heavily deficient in either area of, of word recognition or the other side of language comprehension, we would insert a zero value there and that product would really end up being zero. So obviously we won't have reading proficiency with a zero product. Any fractional number in either decoding or language comprehension would also result in a much lower value for overall reading proficiency. And ideally readers are gonna be competent and equally competent in both areas of their reading proficiency, so it demonstrates that. So the purpose of this webinar is really to identify what science-based core instruction should entail. It's only right to start with the main philosophical elements that a core literacy curriculum should include. We just looked at the simple view of reading to understand the simplest components of reading proficiency, but what is even more important to understand in relation to the science of reading and core curriculum is what competencies word recognition and language comprehension include and how we should address developing word recognition and language comprehension during early elementary, elementary years. So let's use Scarborough's route to break down how and when we should focus on developing both of these factors um, that were identified in the simple views equation. Scarborough's rope is really the perfect visual to help us understand the ingredients of both language comprehension or oral language and word recognition. 
um, we see that the rote starts off by separating language comprehen comprehension and word recognition. These strands represent those foundational years. Exactly, Megan. And we really want to identify those co components that develop language comprehension by looking at the top strand first, that blue-hued strand on the top. Language comprehension is developed through knowledge building around a variety of topics so that students really acquire a wide range of vocabulary and verbal reasoning skills. You know, understanding how language functions helps them make meaning of text. This enables students to make connections and really ultimately determine the gist of passages they're reading. All the while, they are building deeper background knowledge on a wide variety of subjects, which is what we want them to do. Absolutely. Now let's look at this bottom strand, word recognition. So word recognition is really the ability to recognize written words automatically. We can think of the strand as the set of skills students need to successfully and automatically decode the words on a page. So students must have an awareness of the sounds and words and understand that these sounds in our language are represented by, um, you know, symbols or letters. Um, and have mastery of those familiar words in the English language. The more students are explicitly taught these skills and the more practice they have to develop these skills, the more likely they are to, to um, you know, become skilled decoders who read with automaticity. And as students develop language comprehension and become skilled decoders, we can move along each strand and see that they weave together. Both language comprehension and word recognition reinforce each other and when developed in a manner that places equal importance on both during core instruction, we can see that these strands are strong enough to integrate and produce a proficient reader. You know, Karen, this does not happen overnight. It requires instruction and practice over time. And in relation to core instruction, emphasis on developing both oral language and decoding should be equally as important in your daily literacy block. So Megan, all of that buzz you mentioned earlier relates to what literacy reachers have affirmed. You know, in a nutshell, explicit systematic phonics instruction is a non-negotiable when teaching students how to learn to read. In fact, many states have developed legislation that mandates the use of explicit systematic phonics instruction in those foundational years. So we'd really love to hear how this applies to you all. Please take a minute to answer our newest poll question. Are you using an explicit systematic phonics program in your school? So let's hear from our attendees. Only two choices on this one. I can't wait to see. Yeah, I'm curious. I love polls. Give you a couple seconds more. Can't find the button. All right. So more than half of our respondents are using an explicit systematic program. Great. So, so we're all on that same page in terms of the word recognition or decoding side of the equation. Let's dig into an ILA literacy leadership brief that was published in May. It'll help all of us uncover what effective phonics instruction looks like. We, what we really hope today is that you will make note of these characteristics that we discuss to see if your program addresses all of them. And we'll revisit our list in a little bit. But we, before we do that, Megan, we included a quote from that literacy brief, and it's really one of the most impactful quotes we read. Phonics instruction is helpful for all students, harmful for none, and crucial for some, you know, wow, <laughs> crucial for some is the, is the really big piece there. It says a lot, you know, it hits upon that notion that all kiddos can benefit from phonics. We get asked that question a lot. Can all kids benefit from phonics instruction? And yep, ding, 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 the research says a resounding yes. You know, Karen, it's, it's, I love that we included this and because one bit of factual information that I've heard and read in so many of the trending resources mentioned earlier confirm this. According to research, only 40% of students will learn to read with adequate reading instruction. 
But you know, that leaves out 60% of students. You know, what about those students? And this quote speaks directly to that fact that it's, it's not harmful for any students, but it's crucial for so many. So, right. So really the big question is, what do we mean by explicit and systematic instruction, Megan? So I think we have to start out by defining it, right? Explicit is defined as clearly stating, leaving no doubt. So in relation to what this looks like in the classroom, um, you know, we would tell students as a teacher that the t sound is, as in today, is represented by the letter T. This direct instruction is so much more effective than the discovery method because it doesn't rely on those prerequisite skills that might elude some students given their different literacy experiences. And so tying that into being systematic, we, it really means we follow a continuum from easier to more complex skills. And we're slowly introducing those new skills to build on what's already known. You know, this makes new learning more obvious for kids and easier for readers to understand and connect to what is familiar. You know, we then review what's known and continue to add to that and continue that cycle of repetition so kids can internalize those skills. They're going to experience success that way and move more easily towards mastery of it. But now let's explore some of those characteristics that ILA shared in their brief because these components can help everyone with their checklists and they can determine if their own curricula are considered high quality effective programs. So a critical first piece of a foundational reading curriculum, whether that be teacher developed or you know, whether that be utilizing um, a curriculum that's been published, it's, it's vital to ensure that there's a scope and sequence. This is what sets the entire stage for the curriculum and how students will encounter all aspects of that foundational skill instruction. So a strong scope and sequence should be systematic and follow the sequence of reading foundational skills, building from simple to complex in a way that takes advantage of students' previous learning. That sequential progression of foundational skills can be seen in this image. A curriculum should be rooted in phonological awareness from the beginning. Students should start by learning to manipulate larger chunks of words through identifying and mastering rhyme, syllabication, and onsets of words. And as students begin to master manipulation of larger word parts, that instruction to, should move to develop more complex skills, that being phonemic awareness. Um, you know, and phonemic awareness instruction includes opportunities for students to demonstrate mastery of, you know, oral blending and segmenting individual phonemes, those, those skills that, you know, underlie in parallel reading and writing. But that's all done orally. So once students have a solid phonemic awareness foundation, then it's appropriate to connect those sounds to the most simple sound spelling correspondences. Connecting sounds to print is really where we make that shift to actual phonics instruction. Um, and as students begin to master those simple sound spellings, that phonics instruction should continue to build on those simple sound spelling correspondences and move towards more complex alternative sound spellings. So a strong scope and sequence is what sets the framework for explicit systematic instruction that we're going to break down next. The next key element of effective explicit systematic phonics instruction identified in ILA's brief was readiness skills. These are the two best predictors of early reading success, um, those being alphabet recognition and phonemic awareness. These skills open the gate for reading. It's vital to ensure that phonemic awareness instruction addresses the wide range of subskills that make up phonemic awareness. So activities like oral blending and oral segmenting are look for in core phonics instruction because these are those skills that have the most positive impact on reading and writing development in kindergarten and grade one. But the phonemic manipulation tasks actually play a crucial role up to grade three as students begin to encounter multisyllabic words and text. And so blending really is that primary strategy for teaching students to sound out words. We simply string together sounds to symbols to make those words. With explicit modeling by teachers you know, being a critical step, that, since that needs to be a go-to strategy when it's practiced and applied to real text. 
you know, it starts with single syllable words, like you said, but plays a huge role when kids transition to multisyllabic words. They're going to continue to encounter, we know all too well. Yeah. Uh, we know if students struggle with the blending of sounds, their transition to connecting sounds to decoding words is going to be a big problem, and our upper grade teachers definitely can experience that. You know, a core curriculum should include blending activities like you're seeing on the screen that are fun and they use kinesthetic movements. A variety of materials helps us to practice this skill orally. Showing a picture of s, uh, mm, sorry, I'm really articulating it for you. So students can blend the sounds into the word sun and using gross and fine motor motions to blend sounds into words like uh, mm, one of our, another rhyming word here, are some easy examples of activities that you can use during your phonics instruction. We want to ensure mastery of the necessary phonemic awareness skills before decoding actual texts on a page. And I'm sure so many of our teachers listening today are doing a lot of those activities already. Absolutely. I think that, the, you know, Karen, I loved that you focused on that articulation piece, but I think what's so important here is that we're not, con we're not connecting this to print initially, that this is done orally. Exactly. The next key characteristic identified in the brief is word awareness. Word building and word sorts are other key activities to increase students' word awareness. You know, word building really um, increases students' ability to manipulate individual sounds flexibly and fully analyze words for their component sounds and spelling. So adding, substituting, or deleting individual phonemes and words can really identify who has a solid phonemic awareness foundation. These activities can and should be interactive. So what you're seeing in this video is an activity called chaining and students are using these chaining these large letter cards to turn the word man into the word main. And you know, Karen, I have to share a story about my five year old son, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, I have some of these, these chaining cards at home. And the other night he saw them that, you know, they're from my classroom. His teacher uses them too. Um, and he, he was so excited to find them that after he got out the tub, he brought them to me and he said, Hey mom, can, can we build words like I do in Miss Courtney's class? And so he laid out all his vowels and consonants separately and he wanted me to give him words to build. And he didn't even realize that in that moment he's learning, you know, um, because it was so engaging to him. He thought we were just playing. I love, I love that moment. Exactly. And you're so lucky you have those moments and that he is five and you're going to experience all of that. My 20, well, almost 22 this month, uh, my 22 year old used to do those things at home too. And I remember, you know, when he would ask me to try to spell words when he was younger and he thought, he thought we were playing games too. And he thought we, he loved playing school. So they're, when they're learning and they don't even know it, it's just amazing. And it it's happens. the best. Time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, those fun activities that, we are talking about tie together word awareness and associating sounds to letters. And we wanna make sure kids can transfer those same correspondences to writing. Again, teachers are gonna model this application in writing with activities like think alouds and demonstrations. It's definitely not about a spelling test. It's really about the application. It's to measure kids' internalization, you know, and the ability for them to apply those sound spelling correspondence giving them increased opportunities to really try out their developing skills, to express ideas in a written form. And kids really want to do that. They always want to mimic what people are doing in terms of writing. That's where the real measure can take place here. And the activity shown here on, on the screen demonstrates how systematic instruction is applied in terms of practice. And students are connecting a newly learned vowel team, a vowel in the magic E there, to CDC words. It's something where they've had multiple experiences in practice already. But you know, ILA in that article calls out both blending and dictation as important characteristics because a strong program is going to teach both of those things, decoding and encoding in tandem, because these are the skills that really underlie and parallel reading and writing. You know, that's our ultimate goal, not just reading, but reading and the transfer to writing. It's both of them. We want kids to be able to do both of those things fluidly. And what it you're right. And what a great activity to show that systematic approach, pre, you know, building on previously learned skills. Exactly. Uh, you know, the panel also stressed the importance of including high frequency words 
um, you know, in, in that core instruction. And we know as educators, all of these high frequency words have to be mastered. Uh, students who get hung up on high frequency words really don't have a shot of fluently reading. High frequency words should be practiced in text, in multiple reading activities, but the article also highlighted that we can't forget to monitor or assess students' mastery of these high frequency words in, you know, kindergarten, first and second grade. And if there's a need for it after those years, then it's, it's vital that we do that as well for those kids who are struggling to read fluently, you know, because a lack of fluency can really impede comprehension. And, and, you know, the next characteristic is huge and something that really is the difference maker in students' confidence and self-efficacy around reading. The, if the goal of phonics instruction is to develop students' ability to read, then they have to, you know, apply that in a connected text independently and have those opportunities to do so. Controlled decodable text, or, you know, are also known as accountable text, at the beginning level of reading instruction helps students develop a sense of comfort um, and, and control over their reading growth and should be a key learning tool in early phonics instruction because this is where they get to apply those foundational skills that you have just explicitly taught during that core phonics instruction. And you know, providing kids with that connected text, we're giving them an opportunity to apply those skills that were just explicitly talk, like we were talking about with high frequency words, all of those things are tied in. It's through practicing those skills and those that those early readers are going to become automatic and more highly dis, highly skilled decoders. You know, when providing students with texts that aren't connected to the skills, the ones that they just learned, you know, students rely on other strategies that may be counterproductive in the long run. And if attendees want to hear more about this, they can subscribe to Emily Hanford's podcast, Hard Words, Why Kids Aren't Reading to Learn, I'm sorry, Why Kids Aren't Learning to Read. She really delves deeply into that topic. And, you know, people can also check her out with Susan Lambert or one of our first Science of Reading podcasts as well. They, they talk about that as well. So, wow, that was a lot, Karen. Exactly. Um, it's no surprise, though, that the researchers found that the biggest problem with phonics implementation is the unbalanced approaches or haphazard implementation methods found in so many programs. Yeah, and hopefully everyone will be able to use this checklist to look at their current pro approaches to phonics instruction. And, you know, think about it. a high quality foundational skills program is something all educators should have and all kids should have access to. And something that came up in the chat that I just wanted, and I can't quite see everything about it, but, you know, we didn't hit on fidelity and fidelity is an important piece. We, we aren't going to get into that today, but the pieces need to be there and they need to be used with fidelity. Yeah, what a great point. And and you're so right, Karen, you know, about what you stated about all, you know, teachers and students having access to this, whether or not that phonics curriculum, the phonics curriculum you're currently using is teacher created or a program that your school or district has adopted, you can, you know, or maybe you're looking to adopt a program, you can use this checklist to make sure that your phonics instruction is truly effective. If, if one of these pieces or these components are missing, then you have some ideas for how to like close those gaps in your instruction. All right, Megan. So as we've already discussed, in order to become proficient readers, students are going to have to have both the decoding skills and the language comprehension competencies. So the ILA brief we just, uh, we just discussed gave us some great look fors when determining what key elements need to be included. Now let's dig into the other factor that's definitely equally as important when trying to build proficient readers. And sometimes this gets overlooked a little bit more. And what is it? Language comprehension. So Megan, what exactly are the ways to build language comprehension in an age appropriate manner? Let's talk about that. You know, Karen, for decades, we've tried to teach comprehension as a set of skills, right? Finding, find the main idea, find the theme, et cetera. But what research has shown is that these skills don't really transfer if students don't have the background knowledge or vocabulary necessary to make meaning of the text being read. So in order to develop, to develop language comprehension, developing background knowledge and vocabulary around the range of topics is the place where we have to start at the earliest grades possible. 
if we can expo expose students to a wide range of worldly topics and help them acquire vocabulary through the building of this background knowledge, then we are essentially developing their oral language. This is what constitutes the need for using a knowledge rich curriculum as a part of core literacy instruction. Okay, now we're gonna go back, make sure everybody's with us still. We want another poll question. We'd love to hear how many of you are currently using a knowledge rich curriculum. Another love hearing, yeah, from our participants. I can't wait to see the results. This is an easy one too, one, two responses. We'll give them a few more seconds to respond. Wow, it's almost identical to the uh, to the poll question. That's really neat. Yeah. So, fifty-seven percent of our participants said yes, they are. Forty-three percent said no. I love that we have such. You know, it's it's almost equally balanced. Um, so now as we're so, going to continue with this, we hope you make note of the characteristics the knowledge rich curriculum has to see if your instructional path addresses them. And we've composed a list from many of the trending articles and the books, all the things that Megan mentioned earlier, the buzz, to assist you in having some look for to either evaluate your curriculum, the one that 50, what is it, 57 percent of the people were using. Um, and so some of the key look fors that you'll hear us highlight over the next few slides are on this on this slide. You know, we're going to look at a wide variety of topics, how that plays a role, building knowledge, that intentionality, that's a really key piece, how vocabulary plays into that, as well as the instruction that'll support the comprehension during the reading. And again, we also want students speaking and writing about that content. That is critical. It's not just us talking to them, but it's them applying what they're learning. You know, Karen, and I think the first place to start is, is right here. And this, this is an example of a knowledge sequence that demonstrates all of those points we just mentioned, or especially more so, you know, if you look closely at these topics in this sequence, you'll notice, you know, there are nine to 12 different topics per grade level that are building knowledge and vocabulary, not just within grade levels, but across grade levels. This is intentional, right? Um, these topics revolve around, if you look closely, like science, social studies, literature, different cultures, art. And I think the important thing to note here is, is like I said, that just the wide variety of, ex of, of, of different topics that you should be exposing students to, um, or a knowledge-rich curriculum would include. Um, you know, having this many topics also allows you as an educator to introduce a new topic every two to three weeks that's so exciting for kids and and when you see their excitement it gives you know it it, it it's just so rewarding um it also eliminates us focusing on a topic for you know eight to nine weeks you know what about those students who aren't engaged and are interested in learning about that specific topic and you know one thing i've heard from teachers is well, what about the teacher who doesn't want to teach the same topic for eight or nine weeks? This is such a good point. But right. how do we do this in early foundational years, you know, especially when students are spending so much energy decoding and there's not much room left for comprehension. Also, if you look at these topics, they may not have those pieces of code to really actually decode the words on the page, right? So okay. how do we do that? So it's not really uncommon for educators to be unfamiliar with this research that demonstrates that listening comprehension far outpaces reading comprehension until the age of 13. So Karen, I'm curious to find out, what is the, when you ask um, educators this question, you know, what is the most common answer you get? Like what age do they think reading comprehension ability catches up to listening comprehension ability? Well, I'll tell you the first thing, when I usually ask this, they're not expecting a quiz question. So they're, they're in more of a passive mode, but usually you know, after we um, have a little conversation, yeah, it's usually they kind of guess ages, age nine or 10. What about you, Megan? You know what? That's so funny. It's the same. So eight, nine, and 10 are the most common. And I think it goes back to just the third grade like well this is where students should be reading to learn at this point and i think that's why we get that common answer mm -hmm. um 
but you know, this research always seems to surprise many educators, myself included, but it's also eye opening and really gives us insight on how we can develop students oral language in an age appropriate manner, especially in early years. Um, you know, those years where they're, they're learning how to decode words on a page, we can actually eliminate the cognitive energy spent on decoding and capitalize on students listening comprehension ability to build rich knowledge and vocabulary during, during core instruction through the use of a daily read aloud, a daily oral read aloud, you know, um, and we love reading to our students, right, Karen? <laughs> Oh, definitely, definitely. All right, so we want to give you a moment to read. This is the International Literacy Association's definition of a read aloud. And we want you to, know, as you read this and think about one thing that really stands out for you about reading aloud to kids. So I'm not going to read this to you. I'm going to let you read it to yourselves. Although we do have uh, our listeners, so why don't I read it? How about a read aloud is the practice of a teacher or designated reader orally reading a text with large or small groups. Only the reader sees the text. All other participants are listeners. The intent is to model proficient reading and language, promote conversation, motivate, and extend comprehension and conceptual understandings. And so, you know, Megan, the one thing that stands out for me in this is really that aspect of promoting a conversation. It's gotta be a two-way street. You know, the teacher's role really becomes that of a facilitator, you know, where the rich ideas are flowing back and forth both ways from the kids to the teacher and vice versa. What about you, Megan? What stands out? So I think the thing that stands out for me when I, especially when I reflect back on my experience in the classroom is, you know, that modeling proficient reading. And I think back on so many of my students who unfortunately didn't have opportunities at home to hear someone model proficient reading and hear, you know, complex language that authors often use in text. Exactly. And reading aloud is really such a ubiquitous practice in elementary settings. As you just said, we do love reading aloud to kids. As many teachers, that's what that drove them into education, right? As you can see from these citations that we've shared here, there's a ton of research to support it too. So that makes sense. Many of you are probably familiar with some of these researchers and all their findings. You know, it's not a coincidence that this research that we're sharing here closely aligns with that definition that you just, or that I read to you. You know, one key to effectively using read alouds to foster language comprehension and that side of Tunmerge and Goff's work is on the simple view of reading is really including kind of a clear and scope and sequence that's really similar to the one we talked about for phonics instruction because we really want to be intentional and we want to develop an intentionally rich content and background knowledge as well as vocabulary with that both a vertical and horizontal alignment. As Megan shared that, that domain sequence, you see vertical and horizontal alignment with those rich content areas. And that formal language of printed text is something students really need modeled because they're going to encounter that language on their own as they read more challenging texts. And Megan talked about that, the kids that haven't had that experience at home. You know, content-rich read-alouds, especially on those connected topics, provides them with that language of print. It gives them access. And that's really what we're trying to do, give all kids access. It's really about equity too. And Natalie Wexer, if any of you have read the one of, we, we showed her book earlier, uh, she discusses this in the knowledge gap and how authors do leave out a, a lot of information when they write. They're assuming a lot about the reader and assuming that the reader has, you know, even a certain amount of basic knowledge so that when we build knowledge through those two to three week units with those rich kind of worldly robust topics, we're going to provide so much of that language for students to continue to build upon. And we especially, I think this is key, we especially invite our listeners to use that language and to own it. And kids love owning great vocabulary. It's not just about incorporating that read aloud during instruction, but the purpose of that is to deliver that rich knowledge so all children have access. And again, looking for content and curriculum that revolves around topics that include multidisciplinary topics. We want kids to have exposure to a wide range. These read-alouds are going to be intentionally sequenced and build knowledge about that topic, again, over the course of, of two to three weeks, as Megan said, versus, you know, eight to nine or even longer. 
Yeah, and you know, another important thing to note is the importance of read aloud text being above grade level. So this provides exposure and support with navigating complex text and builds vocabulary and fluence, you know, gives opportunities for modeling that fluency. Um, a knowledge rich read aloud should also have opportunities for students to deconstruct and, you know, comprehend text. And so, you know, Karen, let's define how we can intentionally engage students in a read aloud so that knowledge building time within core instruction is effective. So if we take a moment to read the definition of interaction, I mean, interactive, I'm so sorry, this definition can help us reboot and think about how we can make knowledge building through a read aloud, you know, engaging. Um, if we look at it, it's, you know, part of that definition is allowing a two-way flow of information, right? Um, so, you know, Karen, I, we've talked about, you know, how to make sure that that's interactive. So I'm excited for you to share how we can do that. Well, and I love in that definition too, having an effect on each other. Really, that's what it's all about. You know, a read aloud should be a daily literacy event. I mean, you know, I love that word event, making it really special. It isn't about kids just passively taking in information. We're trying to make sure we've got a, a wonderful, enthusiastic teacher playing that part and inviting that listener into the text through targeted questions as well. It's not just random. And we're focusing on all depth of knowledge levels. And that's what lays the foundation for close reading because that's gonna be our next step. Once kids, we're, we still read aloud to them, but when they're getting into the text, close reading becomes that interactive activity. It's essentially in this stage, a close listening activity. It should be designed to be intentionally interactive because so close reading becomes that as well. Yeah, and, and so this read aloud is really, you know, when we're talking about these interactive read alouds and building knowledge, we're talking about those foundational years, you know, K through through two. Um, but what we're doing here is, you know, science based reading is, is a matter of equity. We know that not all students arrive at school with the same background knowledge and too many curricula assume that students enter a classroom knowing the exact same things. Therefore, while we build on and celebrate students individuals individual experiences, it's also you know, our responsibility as educators to bring the world into our classrooms. Um, and, and it's it, amazing at how much it sparks their curiosity because they all want to jump in. So, you know, as we work to help students integrate their oral language and decoding competencies, the standards are going to now shift their focus. And so should your curriculum because we're moving where that strand integrates. Foundational skills are going to become more established as a result of that early literacy instruction. And as students progress into that third, fourth, and fifth grade and move on, the focus of those standards shift as well as the cognitive demands placed upon kids. And so instead of focusing on the phonemes and words like in early years, the standards shift to focus on, you know, study of word parts, greater focus on vocabulary and morphology. And we want to connect this to rich contents in, you know, where students are reading and it can, it can help them understand and learn various morphemic elements to determine the meaning of new words they may encounter in complex text. Because now, you know, the onus is a little bit more on them. Yeah, so, absolutely. We're going to get a little deep here, Megan. And, and All people, right, Karen. <laughs> people are going to have to get their, their visualization um, strategies in place because we're going to have a heavy emphasis on vocabulary and meaning in the upper grades. But with that, you know, we can look more closely at instruction focused on morphology. Affixes, you know, roots, Latin and Greek, all of those contain meaning units versus that sound unit of phonemes, which has been the really the greater focus in word recognition strand. You know, in the early grades, and sometimes we don't think about this, you know, we teach the grapheme S that it implies more than one, which brings a change of meaning to a word, you know, it makes it plural. So that one little bit of meaning knowledge goes such a long way when kids learn it. But in the upper grades, understanding larger units of meaning like roots and affixes really can enable kids to build more vocabulary knowledge that's gonna carry across with them. And so when explicit instruction includes an analysis of a word like geology, so you see in the domain there, we've got the picture of a, a cover of a book with geology on it. And we provide, skills that can help kids transcend that topic outside of geology. If kids learn that the suffix, you know, the Greek suffix ology is the study of and the Greek root, you know, geo means earth, 
we've immediately told them what this whole domain is going to be about. So the entire domain is going to relate to the study of the earth. Then they can easily transfer that. You know, the biology is the study of life or zoology is the study of animals. It really builds them a wider base of knowledge that's going to apply across areas. And whatever content you're teaching, you know, you should include a variety of activities tied to that rich content instruction based on vocabulary and morphology that really helps kids go deeper. Yeah, so as we move through this information, hopefully we've helped you identify some key look fors when determining how to incorporate, um, you know, a knowledge rich curriculum into your core instruction. Um, we've given you this checklist. Now you have something to go, you know, build from but if you want to know more and dive in deeper to the science of reading you know all of the information and research that was shared today about tying the science of reading into core instruction really covers each of these design principles identified in susan's last webinar in january but if you missed out you can still register and receive the recording um, and you know many of our registered attendees are already participating in this inspiring and collaborative conversation. Um, if, you know, we'd love to have you join this discussion by becoming a member of our Science of Reading Facebook group. And if you want to hear from some of those literacy experts and researchers we mentioned today and learn more about effective core instruction, please subscribe to Amplify Science of Reading podcast that began back in August. So you can hear all of our, you know, previous podcasts, um, and then, you know, get updated when a new one comes in. Uh, this is really just so powerful, um, you know, to, to re evaluate what your current practices look like. And so, Megan, we are happy to take some questions now, but we have a little time left before we go. And so before we start taking some questions, I do want to remind people that, you know, we haven't really talked about um, the successes as well as challenges districts and schools face as they come to try to learn about the science of reading and, and you know the shift it takes to implement that and put that into action and so next wednesday we're going to have another webinar and this is wonderful megan's going to actually be meeting with the team to chat about their journey and so megan why don't you share a little teaser for everybody yeah i'm super excited because next wednesday i'll be hosting coaches and teachers from liverpool liverpool central school district and upstate in, Sy in the syracuse area in new york um you know it's there's nothing more refreshing than hearing from other educators you know who are vulnerable and willing to share not just the successes right of putting the science of reading into action in their kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms but also, you know, hearing them share their internal and external challenges, you know, that they faced when moving away from past pedagogical approaches that were really ingrained in them. And, you know, they've used for their entire teaching careers. So it's going to be a phenomenal conversation that I really hope you all can join us for. Um, so you can go and, and sign up and, and if you can't make it, be sure to register so you can receive the recording. Someone asked in the chat, now we've got some time for questions. Someone asked a question about going back to the page about a wide variety of organized topics. So Megan, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the domain sequence. Yeah, well, I think I, 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 you know, to speak to that, I think if it is the domain or just a wide variety of topics as students progress through life as they you know are taking standardized assessments you know the more we expose them to the wider range of topics the more likely they're going to you know have some background knowledge about the text that they're they're encountering if we limit that exposure um you know it's almost a, you know a disservice to them if we have that opportunity to really expose them to a wide range of background knowledge and you know to build vocabulary within that that content and i'm not sure if they wanted to actually see the the list or that i'm not sure if that if the person uh, wants to, re to to uh respond to that we'd be happy to do that i do see a question about a recommendation for read alouds in middle school and as a former middle school reader or i'm sorry teacher I loved reading aloud to my kids and my kids really loved it. There is so much of a benefit to that. You know, 
really reading aloud to kids is giving them access to language and to the, the print and the syntax and all of that that they may not be able to access easily themselves. And I had a lot of struggling middle school readers, so they really benefited from that. And again, there are so many great read alouds for middle school. And it you know, depends on, again, looking at your curriculum. Um, you want to see where there's knowledge-based curriculum to be able to do that. And I think sometimes we focus more on literary text and informational, but there's great, there's great examples of both. So I would strongly encourage people to read aloud uh, to middle school kids. And Megan, I'm not sure if you're seeing some of the questions. I'm going to... Uh, can't, if you want to read them, Karen, I can't see sure. them. Yep. Um, We've got a second year reading teacher here interested in the pros and cons of using Dolch versus fry, fry sight words. And I know Megan will be able to share about that. She's using one of them versus the other. But I think Megan will talk to you about the decodable aspect of sight words. Yeah, so I think when we, when we think about, you know, high frequency words, if, if we're using an explicit systematic approach to teaching phonics or, you know, those foundational skills, those decodable words will become automatic practice um, because of that solid phonemic awareness foundation that would have been established. Um, but in regards to, you know, high frequency words that are not decodable, those have to be explicitly taught. Um, and so, so we don't get, you know, so like we said, you know, readers or students don't get hung up on those. Um, but as they're taught, explicitly taught those irregular high frequency words, they have to have opportunities to practice those as well in, in text. Okay. And we've got another question from a fourth grade class. Having, is having the book up on the screen during a read aloud wrong then? I often have one copy up on the screen so they can read along with me to see where I speed up, slow down, put emphasis, et cetera. Meanwhile, I walk around the room as I'm reading. You know, I don't, I absolutely think that that's appropriate. You know, at fourth grade, students have gone through mastering those foundational skills. And so when we think about you know, age appropriateness, um, them following along in a text is, is definitely developmentally appropriate as you're reading aloud. And the purpose of a read aloud in, you know, fourth grade is, you know, obviously to build the background knowledge and vocabulary that they're going to need to access, you know, the text that they're going to read independently after. Do you agree, Karen? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think that when you're thinking about, do I have print in front of kids? when I'm reading or not. It's all about the, the cognitive demand that you're trying to focus on for kids. Are you really, you know, because if they're working on the text level, it's a decoding level, right? They're looking at the text and trying to decode. And so it all depends on your level of students. Um, and I think you can determine that. So it's really your, and as Megan mentioned, your purpose too. But sure, at fourth grade, when if they've mastered, if you've got that foundational skills um, in place, if you've got, um, a, an explicit systematic phonics program in place where they've hopefully been able to master those skills in grades K to two, and they're coming to you with a mastery of the sound spelling correspondences and they're able to, then sure, I mean, why not? They're reading along with you because you're giving them text that they can read. Absolutely. Um, I just saw a net, I did see a question in the chat. I can see the chat. Uh, which reading program is lunch trades from oh is that oh, the one you shared yeah yeah so that was the connected um text slide so that is a decodable reader from actually um amplifies uh core literacy um curriculum core knowledge language arts so that you got to see was our connected text and that was actually a kindergarten text um towards so, the end of the year, wasn't it? The one yeah, that, yeah, it's the last unit. Yeah, absolutely. Kindergarten last unit. So, so all the screenshots that you did see came from the, our uh, CKLA curriculum. Great. Do we have any more questions coming in, Karen? We, I'm just seeing, I'm actually kind of off screen. Mm-hmm. I'm scrolling Hi, up. Um, this is Madigan. We did get some more questions in. We have one that says, how do I begin to broach the subject of knowledge-rich curriculums with my administrators? 
Ooh, that's a great question. That is a great one. You know what? I am going to just suggest reading The Knowledge Gap exactly. <laughs> uh, by Natalie Wexler. Uh, you know, Natalie really put, Natalie's book, The Knowledge Gap, just puts, um, you know, explains the research behind, um, you know, using a knowledge-rich curriculum. Um, she compares a classroom that is using a knowledge-rich curriculum to a classroom that's not. Um, and then she also includes some of the research from, you know, cognitive psychologists like Dan Willingham. And um, that is a powerful text for anyone to read. I couldn't put it down my first time. <laughs> was I think that's a great idea, as well as, you know, just exposing people to some of the podcasts and, and some of the, the research, the articles out there that are, you know, they're, that are, seem to be everywhere. Um, I think slowly but surely, that's the, the path to take. It, it doesn't happen always overnight. And I think that's yeah. great. And Megan's going to talk next week to some folks that can share some ideas with you on that as well. I just, have to, I just have to interrupt and I, this is so off topic, but I'm looking at the chat and I, I am so excited to have somebody here from Aruba. It is snowing where I'm at right now in Indiana. And so thinking about Aruba and Portugal, we've got people, I, it's just exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Latin America okay. here and, um, and New Mexico. We've got people from all over. I love it. So thank you for joining us today. It's really been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yes. Madigan, do we have any other questions? I know we're running out of time. I don't want to keep people past. The, I honor people's time. Uh, we do have some more questions, but if they have, uh, if we didn't answer your question today, uh, you can always email us or go to our website at uh, amplify.com and use the chat window, and we will be happy to answer any of your questions. Perfect. And Madigan, do you want to ask one more last question? Sure. Okay. Um, somebody in the Q&A chat box asked for which uh, resources for teaching do you suggest for vocabulary or morphology in K through two? You know, I think honestly, you've got to look at your, the curriculum that you've got. So, I mean, with, with CKLA, you know, that's, those are embedded and what you want to try to find is what's embedded within that curriculum, whatever knowledge-based curriculum you're using. Um, you, you want to see that integrated. It's one of the things we try to convey to teachers with, especially with our, you know, discussions is that everything being connected really helps kids because they can make those deeper connections with vocabulary related to content, with morphology, like the word geology, you know, it's going to relate to what we're going to be talking about for that whole two to three weeks. And so however you can look at that, um, it's, it's, See if you've got that related to what you're working with. I think that's the first line of defense. Megan, I'm not sure if you have anything to add about Yeah, no, I agree. I think the important thing to note there is that, you know, developing vocabulary um, should happen naturally or, or as, as you're um, building background knowledge through the use of, of complex text. Um, hearing those in content and if those, if those stories or that, that knowledge rich curriculum has includes stories that build upon one another, you know, around don't, you know, knowledge domains, then they're going to hear those words, those same academic and domain specific vocabulary words, like within that domain. And if they're building within and across grade levels, they're going to hear those words again as well. So that's like those durable learning opportunities to expand, you know, and really um, impact students vocabulary. Okay, I just saw that clock hit three o'clock and I want to honor teacher's time. <laughs> I know there's nothing more valuable than time. Exactly. Thank you all so much. So, for thank you guys for joining. Yes. We hope to see you again next week with Megan. Hope you learned something and had fun. <laughs> Thanks, guys.